I'm Dennis Main. Welcome to another Tuesday tutorial. These tutorials serve several purposes. First and foremost is the educational aspect. We work with complex technologies and it's difficult to keep up. Number two, this is a demonstration of technical leadership by the principal engineers who are sharing their expertise on a variety of topics. These topics cover our NET product line as well as many advanced engineering concepts. And number three, this sharing of knowledge is an effective means for technology transfer. As the series is being taped, the resultant video library provides continual training opportunities, particularly for new engineers. Number four, career development is enhanced in a number of ways. Certainly one way is the forum for public speaking. And it's a fun get together, a positive part of our corporate culture. And finally, does top management support the Tuesday tutorial series? Yes. 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 Absolutely, unequivocally, yes. And now for this week's Tuesday tutorial. Today we're going to have something uh, a little unusual. We're going to have an outside speaker, uh, Dr. Alan Defino and Cecilia Chen from Epitech Microcomputer Consultant is here to talk about some of their ideas on real-time design. And so without further ado, gentlemen. And uh, uh, Mike Gravener, I work with these two gentlemen. Uh, essentially, we over the last in a decade of Elotech's work, they started evaluating what they were doing. And this is what came out of it. What we need now is a critical audience. And for critical audiences, I'll pass this out at the end, along with the paper we have written for you, we just presented at BUSCOM. But we welcome your questions and uh, thoughts on how we have approached the wonderful world of real-time software. And without further ado, we say we have Thank you. I think I'm supposed to get over to the bright side of the world here. And uh, I'm all wired, so can you folks hear me back there? Yes, no? Okay. <clears throat> it's uh, interesting, but I just gave a presentation over in the Orient, and you know, you're supposed to be humble over there and it's customary to start the presentation with an apology. <laughs> of course here in the state where we started with a joke. <laughs> and so I'm still confused from that exercise, so I guess what I decided to do is to apologize for not telling a joke. <laughs> now really I had some real good computer jokes in my computer system, but my system won't print computer jokes. So it prints other type of jokes. <laughs> Uh, we're here to talk about a real-time software development technique called hierarchical software state machine, or that's a tongue twister, it's HSSM for short. And uh, uh, my associate, Alan, myself, are going to go back and forth. I'm going to go into, the, uh, into a brief introduction, the history of HSSM. Al is going to come back and talk about the motivation behind HSSM and dive right into the HSSM objects and process and actually go into a how to abstract the state machine model. Then I'll come back and present a one or two case study depending on how much time we have in here. And that should give us plenty amount of time at the very end to get acquainted with your questions and answers and we want to encourage as much of the questions and, and, uh, that you may have. As a matter of fact, if you don't have any questions, we brought in a few, so you question us or we'll question you. Uh, 
before I get into the actual presentation, I promise my office manager to ask four quick questions. I'd like to see uh, how many of you are presently involved either in the implementation or management of real-time software. Can I see your hand? Should be just about everybody here. That's just mm -hmm. about everybody, okay. And uh, how many of you are acquainted with the concept of finite state machine? That's almost everybody, okay. And this is a tough one. How many of you of you are using a methodology? <laughs> I don't have to ask the next question. <laughs> okay. During the presentation, if when we're talking about HSSM, if uh, in any form we're implying that it's an all or none methodology, please don't feel so, because in reality, what HSSM is. Uh, is that any part of the technique is applicable and co can coexist with any practice. So, uh, as a matter of fact, when you look into the history of HSSM, it always uh, utilized either theory or practice type of concept and applied it to the real world problem that was uh, uh, attempting to, to solve at that time. So, feel free to steal any ideas that we're presenting it here, and we've been kind of borrowing ideas from both the academics and uh, the practical community. The uh, history of uh, HSSM, uh, it was actually conceived in a laboratory, and this was in the laboratory of Elnother Research uh, a while back, and they had to, they had a problem at that time, they were trying to produce or develop a system that have some hardware limitations. So when you have hardware limitations, how do you solve that? With software, right? Okay. So uh, the problem with that system is that they had some limitations that you probably never heard about. There are limitations in CPU power and memory. <laughs> so during that process, a task force was formed and uh, two major concepts were uh, brought up at that time. One of them was the concept of the run to completion model. And the other one was the abstraction of a state machine. A third element then was brought into the picture that would make the uh, state machine abstraction and the run to completion model come to fruition. And, and this is the concept of, or the element of message switching. The message switching is what some uh, other people would call the control activity uh, element, and it's actually the nerve binding that makes the run to completion model and the state machine abstraction come to uh, life. Okay. So <clears throat> the advantages of the run to completion model is that it provides a very shallow memory uh, organization. They have some stack problems, some memory usage problems. So it's very efficient in its usage of memory. And the state machine, of course, it makes it very efficient in the usage of uh, CPU power. Okay, so those two things uh, were very important in that uh, picture. And so you may want to ask, uh, what is different about HSSM? And uh, I think I'd like to just summarize it with four words. It's simple, it's fast, it's modular, and it's proven. Sounds like marketing, or not marketeer, but that's, it's simple because it gives a consistent model from beginning to the end of the implementation, all the way from requirement all the way to deployment. And it does that with the abstraction of the state machine. Uh, it's fast because it can radically uh, reduce the development time and maintenance time also. It does that with the concept of the operational specification. And uh, Al is going to get into that uh, in a short moment. Then the modularity uh, <laughs> process comes about from the heavy usage of object-oriented uh, elements. And of course, with that process, then the concept of reusability is uh, are there. Also, it promotes teamwork. And for our friend managers, also, it helps them to be able to pass the, both the, the budget and the scheduling issues are much easier. Right? We want to make it easier for our bosses to do that too. 
it's proven, it's been used for the past 10 years or more in a variety of industrial and commercial applications. And as a matter of fact, I have two case studies in here that I've uh, brought in. And uh, uh, Dennis was just mentioning that you folks are dealing with one, about one million sites of code. I, I, we intentionally chose the lower end because we were trying to show well, how much CPU can you uh, efficiently make use of. So we brought in some very, very small CPU uh, microcontroller type of application, but they will probably show you what it can do in terms of the functionality versus code compression uh, that you can probably uh, uh, obtain with that. And it so happens that one of the case studies is in the uh, telecommunication area in the ISDN 2B1Q type of environment. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to my associate here, Al. Thank you. Okay. Oops. Okay. This uh, little sort of logo gives you an idea, um, a preview to HSSM. It's a modeling approach. And the first question we like to ask is, why do we employ a real-time method? The idea is that um, if you take a methodical approach, uh, you can uh, do your job better because you follow a procedure, you follow an organizational template. So since time-critical systems are very challenging, it's a good idea to do that. And a real-time method has to consider the temporal relationships of all the functionality going on. And so it, you have to employ something that is considered a real-time method. Project deadlines have to be met. It's uh, not useful to have a, a, uh, an approach that doesn't get the job done. It's nice to have a model, but the model has to be useful. Teams of designers have to have formal documentation to work with one another. I guess I could ask you, what's the level of your system documentation in the company? And this approach, a methodical approach to development, the documents that you would normally want to have uh, to say your system was documented are produced before you produce the code. So it's, it's sort of a natural byproduct of using the method. It enhances software reuse because a good uh, method will be, in this day and age, object-oriented. And finally, uh, when you have good um, visible designs and you have an object-oriented approach, the uh, changing requirements, which are always with us, are easy to accommodate. Now the question is, what is the HSSM method? probably haven't heard of it because it hasn't been promulgated much, but uh, you can at least have an idea what it's all about. It's, it stands for hierarchical software state machines. That means that we produce a hierarchy of state machines in our modeling and our implementation. It's object-oriented because the state machines encapsulate the process. You know, They represent a process inside of this state machine is a timing diagram, the temporal relationships, and also encapsulated in the machine are any data objects it needs to support its process. The um, hierarchies of state machines are very conveniently also a specification of the real-time character of your system. So the model you start out with an architecture of state machines and a description of how they operate will speak to the person asking for the software. When you implement these state machines in the final system, you're going to have the, uh, the specification that you developed operating in the deployed system. So you have what's called a high, a high degree of requirements traceability. In fact, an amazing amount of high requirements traceability. And when you have high requirements traceability and everybody understands that that's what we wanted, then you have a highly reliable system. It does what the customer wants. When do you employ this method? Well, as I've sort of implied uh, already, you employ it really stem to stern. Now, it's not necessary that you use this 
uh, all of the steps, all the uh, techniques in using HSSM. You could, in fact, uh, develop a model with HSSM for your requirements and never implement it. You could implement it in this, uh, some other way, but it would be a good model of your requirements. When you use the state machine approach, we encourage uh, intense levels of testing of each of the machines so that uh, the systems we have um, deployed are very robust. They, they tend to be more robust than systems developed alongside that were done with other techniques. An example of that was a robotic vehicle at FMC. They were in a face-off with General Dynamics. They went about it in the, sort of the classical way. Uh, FMC used hierarchies of state machines. In the face-off, after they demonstrated the system, the soldiers were there to run the vehicles. The general dynamics system was not able to be run by the soldiers because it took engineers to run it. The FMC group handed over their system to the soldiers and they ran it for two weeks. And it was extremely uh, robust. So the whole point is that with the proper uh, utilization of method and tools, you get a very good result. Excuse me, um, what yes. was your point about testing, intense testing in there? Yeah, in other words, in, in my experience, what you find is that people that do a modular design tend not to thoroughly check the modules before they integrate them. With this approach, since we have a very easy testing paradigm that we've put together, uh, people enjoy testing the modules and they will in fact test them very religiously and completely and then the number of problems you have during integration are reduced uh, markedly. And when you have errors during the uh, integration, our ability to find them is increased because of some other tools, and we'll talk about that. So why do you use HSSM? Like Basilio said, it's simple, okay? It's graphical in nature, so people tend to say, boy, I can understand what the system is doing. Um, and that same abstraction is useful in all the phases. It's fast because since you're only developing one model, there's no reason to make the transformations and to lose the capability, the engineering time that it takes to transform from model to model as you do in some other approaches. It's modular in that the state machines are in fact natural uh, actor style modules. And it's proven uh, this approach has been used uh, in many different environments for 15 years. Got another logo one here for the next section where we're going to talk about the model. And I'm going to go through these diagrams quite quickly because uh, I don't want to bore you, but it's sort of a, a graded presentation. First of all, state machine could be represented with anything. We have chosen to use an ellipse to, to differentiate it from other modeling approaches. So the state machine abstraction, it represents something that will respond to events from its environment. So it's a computing element. And computing elements can be real. In other words, you can transform from an abstraction to a real one, an abstraction of a real one. We have a thermostat. It says in, in whatever system this is going to be, this guy uh, or gal uh, controls temperature. And the question is, well, what events does the state machine deal with? And events are naturally represented by arrows. Arrows are a good uh, representation for an event. And you put the event name over the arrow. It makes a lot of sense. And finally, for the real case, the uh, thermostat case will have temperatures coming in to the system on an occasional basis, and it will uh, impinge somewhere. And the question is, impinges on our state machine. And our thermostat takes in temperature uh, inputs and will respond to them. Now the question is, well, what's next? Do we have to um, uh, do something? This machine has to not only take in input, but it has to make some output. And of course, we see that building onto the model. 
the output event is typically written to the right hand side. That's pretty much a convention with context models. So we use the same approach, although that's not required. And for our thermostat, we could say that when the temperature gets too cool, we better turn the heater on. So that would be one of the things that a thermostat would do for you. You say, well, gee, this is pretty simple. Well, we have to pick a simple example so that it's explainable in 20 minutes. So. And this little uh, cartoon from Computer Magazine last month, we've just shown you a system model. And that was Dave Harrell's representation of a system model. OK. So a context diagram for a state machine or a system uh, being directed by state machines, a whole collection of state machines, would start out being represented by a collection of input events and producing a collection of output events. So that's the first step in a methodical approach is to e exhaustively enumerate all the inputs, exhaustively enumerate all the outputs. And to say, this system, in my imagination, will do all of these things. Is, is there a, an implied relationship in the order of the input events? No, no, no. It's very uh, general purpose. It's like the context diagram of structured design. OK. So for our thermostat, we'll fill out the enumeration. And we say, well, the thermostat's going to have to get temperature events. It's going to have to get set point changes. Change the temperature on your uh, wall, and you say, well, I'd like it to be 68 now, or I'd like it to be 65. It will do that job. And plus, it has to be prepared to be turned on and start doing the job. So those are the three inputs. The um, outputs are very simply heater on and heater off. Now, you can go to the hardware store and buy a thermostat, which is a lot more complicated than this, but that wouldn't help you to understand HSSM any better. It would just take longer for us to explain. So we'll do the simple one. The ones that used to cost $15, I don't know if they even are available anymore. Behavioral design. When you decide on uh, the fact that, well, I have a state machine now. It's called a thermostat. How does it work? We know that it's there. We know what its inputs are. We know what its outputs are. But it's got a behavior. And this uh, step is called the behavioral design step. The prior step called the architectural design step. When you're modeling for uh, a requirements model, you go through an architectural uh, design and a detailed design, just like you do for software development. In fact, the only difference between software development and um, requirements analysis development are, is really the medium. All the rest of it is really the same. The design process is the same. You design a specification for software, believe it or not. OK. So a state machine has in, inside of its behavior states. What are states? Well, states are those places where the machine is waiting for an event to occur. Now, you could say, well, it's where the state machine is looking for the event. But we take a different approach in the, the HSSM method, and we say that the detection of events is outside of the state machines. That's, a, that's um, grist for another part of the architecture. The state machine is there only to respond to events, not to find them. So when it's in a state, it's not doing anything. It's not computing. It's a computing element that's not computing. It's essentially blocked. So when we're in the heating state, in between temperature readings, we're not doing anything for our, our thermostat example. When we start to put together a behavior, we usually find that a state machine, not in all cases, but most state machines, have more than one place where they don't do anything. They don't do anything for different reasons. And the reasons depend on the past history of the machine. And so we diagram these uh, processes as showing, well, the input events, which originated on the left-hand side of our um, context diagram, if you remember, okay, the temperature set point initialize, 
those kinds of things are, uh, become arrows between the states. And when we make a transition from state to state, we can, uh, we'll do it for a different input event reason. And sometimes we might, in some cases, go to another state. But in other cases, for that same event, we would remain in the state we were in or go to some other state. There might be a choice of three states to go to, depending on something in the extended state, which is um, a, um, a uh, data object which is encapsulated in the machine. Okay. When you get an event in a state, then you've got to do some processing. That's the time when the state machine computes. Okay. These computations are represented by uh, lettering the intersection between the state bubble and the input arrow. So every one of those will have a letter associated with it. And that will point to a procedure uh, of pseudocode in the requirements spec in a C program in the um, implementation. Now, the only thing that we haven't covered is the output. And so in the behavior, we have to show the outputs. And the way we show that is that on the input uh, event arrow, we attach an output event arrow, which goes to no state. It points away from all states. And we typically try to point it toward the, one of the edges of the diagram. And it says it's going outside the machine. Okay. And those events can happen to go outside in all cases or conditionally, much like the change of state, conditionally on something in the extended state. And in the case of our thermostat, the two states that we have are heating and off, quite simple. And the whole diagram is represented here. It says, if we just walk through it, that in the heating state, we can either get a temperature that will indicate that it's too warm, and therefore we should turn off the heater. If we turn off the heater, we do a heater off. If it's not warm enough yet, well, we stay in the heating state. If we are in the off state and we get a temperature event and the heat is, is still warm enough, then we remain in the off state. When we decide that we need heat, then we turn the heater on and go to the heating state. Simple. Now, we have a third bubble here called any state, and it represents things that are going to happen to the machine not involved with controlling the heater, and that is the set point input. The set point input comes in in any state and says that uh, we change the set point, which will make uh, d a difference for heat needed or warm enough, those kind of dec decisions. That information is just recorded in the encapsulated uh, data object of the machine, and no state change occurs. <coughs> when the system is first screwed onto the wall and powered up, we have an initialized state coming from the operating environment or the real world, and it says we'll start off in the off state, even if it's 50 degrees in the house, right? Because on the very next temperature input, we'll do it the right thing. So that's an arbitrary choice in this particular case. Yes? Mm -hmm. What are the, the little circles? The circles are the waiting places of the state machine, where it no, waits no, for an input. No, like oh, that, that those are condition indications. If it's a filled dot, it means it's unconditional. If it's an empty dot, it's conditional. And so you should look around on the diagram for the reasons why it's conditional. That's what it. That's what that means. <coughs> you have a question? Or <coughs> okay, so in the middle one there, the condition is. It says, if it's. Two, it's unconditional. We don't have any uh, oh. conditional ones here, unfortunately. Yeah. So uh, th in this case, they're both uh, unconditional. Yes? Well, these are 
Yeah, it's 15 years old, you know, sort of, it's, I guess it has some age. Other people have uh, produced uh, other diagramming. We could use them. It's not, it's not like the, the uh, presentation, you know, we don't have anything automatic with this step. We uh, code these diagrams with a, uh, a state machine algebra in the, co in the programs, and then the, the programs follow the diagram. So we could change that without any problem. When you put together a, a, a complex system, one that's sort of got some meat in it, you're going to have several state machines operating. And they'll operate in a hierarchy which has depth. And that depth is related to the layers of strategy that are required in the uh, functionality. In the um, horizontal direction, you have tactical uh, processing going on. At the lowest levels the, are the tacticians, the drivers, if you will, of the state machine complex. And they can cross communicate with one another. So the event flow across the hierarchy is typically tactically oriented and uh, vertically strategically oriented. And an example of a similar thing that goes on is in any organization, president, vice president, managers on down to the worker bees, all are operating. Whenever the president tells you, um, gives you a strategic direction, um, you know, if he gives strategic direction, save money, the people in the mail room don't ask, well, here's a letter, what should we do, Mr. President? They make tactical decisions independent of the president. So. State, machines hierarch state machine hierarchies work in the same way. They can all do their job independent. When a strategic uh, direction change is required, then the higher level machines will inform lower level machines of those changes. And this sort of summarizes the direction activity dichotomy when real world event comes into the state machine, it produces real world outputs. That's totally tactical. Uh, on the other hand, we can have reporting, synchronization, and direction coordination coming in from above, from uh, higher levels in the hierarchy. And that, uh, that, this is a, a true statement for every level in the hierarchy. Managers have tactical operations to do as well as listening for strategy and giving strategic inputs to their employees. State machines in a hierarchy are designed in the same way. And you say, well, what's, what do real world hierarchies look like? Here's an example of a relatively small real world hierarchy uh, running in a telecommunications application. Okay. And so you have uh, quite a collection of machines doing the job. So, so this is the, the top level, and, and mm -hmm. for each of those, there's a state, state machines, diagram. There's another another diagram. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so and the whole system is described by this plus one for each of those. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, it can get rather busy depending on the complexity of the system. That it might be impractical to make. The, this diagram have all the things you really need on one diagram. So you tend to take sub-diagrams and, and you know, complete the detail. Uh, and an architecture should, I mean, if you go back to your software engineering class, right, an architecture should describe modules and the interfaces between them. And you can see here that the interfaces are probably not complete. I mean, you could get a sense for that, that these modules have more complex in it interfaces than you could show on this diagram. So in the sub-diagrams, we show the whole thing. <coughs> OK. And the next step, we're going to sort of get into the idea of executing the model. I'm going to talk about uh, the first step in that process. And then Basilio will talk about some of the tools and implementation mechanisms. When you want to put a state machine hierarchy into the real world, you essentially want to put it into the universe. So that's the outer layer of the problem. In, a, in an environment that is doing something extremely special, there might be special hardware 
which would be mechanical and electronic in nature to carry out a particular real-time task. Uh, connected to that, in our case, for microcontroller uh, applications, you uh, connect a microcontroller to that special hardware. The next step is inside that microcontroller, you put an environment which we call DSOS for the datagram switched operating system. And then inside of the datagram switched operating system, you package all the state machines as one big set. And the, um, the interrelationships between the state machines as a hierarchy are encapsulated in their design, not in the call return hierarchy. And that sort of completes my section of the uh, presentation. Are there any questions that you have at this point about the modeling approach? Yes. Mm -hmm. Would there be two arrows in the conditional dot? No. How do you, how do you uh, show the choice? The choice, you, uh, you know, next to the, the arrow, you just put the condition for making the arrow. Otherwise, it would not be there. It would be either not there so or if it's there. Straight to straight without an input or you yeah. have to stop. Right, right. Exactly. Yes? How can you tell when an application this model really fits the application, or are you suggesting that this, this method can be used for all problems you know, of a real-time nature? Well, you know, I, I think that there's there's got to be some situations where you can't use it. But on the other hand, if well, do you have some guidelines for that selection? I'd say that if you're really interested in using the method and you're clever, you can just about apply this method to any problem you could imagine. But I mean, I could, I, I'm sure somebody could come up with a counterexample. So I, I can't say that categorically. But so far, I've never seen the situation where we've been totally stymied. We've had to put together a DSOS, which was lean and mean, in order to make it work in a, a, an application we're doing right now. But there's still the concept of message switching in that system. And it's a, working on a, I would say it's an extremely hard real-time system. Yes. Can this methodology be adapted for use with fuzzy state machines? With fuzzy state machines? Yeah. In fact, uh, we did one fuzzy state machine for controlling a, um, a um, pallet nailing transporter that was set up to be outside in the weather. So on a cold day, the grease would be tough. Uh, as, the day, as the sun came up and warmed the unit, it would change its characteristics. And it was sitting there monitoring the, the, uh, the way the conveyor belt worked, and it changed the control algorithm on the fly. So yeah, you can do that. Just because you have all those transition procedures, they can, they can actually access a, um, a, an engine. It was not done with a, uh, you know, a um, inference engine, but it was making inferences about the data it was recording. Yes. What are the principles you would use to determine whether you've gotten the right amount of granularity, let's say, in identifying uh, the... We, we typically, the, the rule of thumb I give people is to say, you should uh, design a state machine that's easy to do. When you get one that's easy, then you have the right level of granularity. Typically what people do is to bite off a bigger chunk than they can handle. They rarely go too small, and then you'd have to agglomerate the functionality. So typically what I tell them, if you're struggling, if you feel like it's a difficult job, then you've got to break it down again. It means that when you did the architectural phase, you said, well, here's a, a machine, but it was really three machines, and you should have you know, then the, the decomposition at the architectural level uh, to a greater degree. Kind of stepping up from that, do you have any, any metrics that you've applied to, to test designs based upon ratios of circles to arrows? Yeah, we, we've uh, found, you know, the one ratio that we have uh, discovered is that state machines tend to be 250 lines of code in their uh, transition procedure set. And that's very constant over several implementations, that the average of the state machines in that implementation will be 250. 
And it can be, you know, it really depends on the problem, you know, how many transitions a machine will have. It's very problem specific. But typically, if you have lots of transitions, they'll be small. If you have few transitions, they'll be bigger. And so the, the average transition procedure, which is typically used once, there are situations where they're used more than once. So that's your problem. There is, I'm sure, an average uh, that we could see, you know, the number of arrows for the number of um, the number of of uh, ellipses, but that that's going to be a constant. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, does hierarchical also imply that uh, child states can make transitions only to parent or to their children, not one step above? No, these are these are really essentially object you know, data, uh, datagram driven objects, they really are not related. They're not parent and child. They're uh, manager and worker. So they, they're, they're not related. And in, inside them, we typically don't do anything very sophisticated except those bubble diagrams. And you could do that, you know, I mean, it's just we don't. Typically, uh, one of the things I found is that it's nice to get people that are not classically thought of as software engineers to actually use this method and they write really dandy real-time systems with it. Yes? Uh, Dr. Alfonso, you, you talk about, uh, in the beginning, about documentation and yeah. architecture design yeah. and probably the coding. Mm -hmm. Would you uh, amplify on that a little bit more? I haven't been very successful to convince my co-worker here. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you why you have trouble convincing people to do that, is that m most of the time people do not know how to do that step. It's something you're not taught in school, and it's a very complicated problem. And unless you practice doing architectures, you won't be able to do them until you're done implementing. And then you say, well, now I've discovered all the interrelationships that if I had used my head, I probably could have figured that out with, before implementing, but I was un. Uh, I didn't have the, I lack the self-confidence to do it. Self-confidence comes from struggling with the first one and making a fool of yourself, and then the next time you'll do it better. But at least you tried. And if you go through that step, you'll get a good job, I guarantee you. It just, um, uh, it's amazing to watch people have never used a structured approach and, and never had penned down an architecture they're always saying, gee, it's amazing that you can make decisions with only this. You know, so they're, they're starting to think at the abstract level. And then when they get down to the point of wanting to implement a state machine, they realize how quickly they can throw together the behavioral diagram because during the time that they were working on the architecture, they were forming a, a very good model for the behavior, and it just spills right out of their head. Yes. Uh, given that you're using a state machine model all throughout the development cycle, how, uh -huh. how feasible is it to do automatic code generation from the digital Well, model? that's another question that, you know, that, that's very complicated. We at Evotech do automatic code generation. I don't know if it's the level of automatic code generation you have in mind, but uh, no, we, we, yeah, we have diagrams. The, the diagrams are translated into an algebra that describes them. And then a state machine compiler compiles C code that does that. Uh, and, and that process has been done almost from the first time that the uh, implementations were done. Probably the most important thing is what you do with testing. Vasilio, you got there? OK. The, it sounds like the hierarchical structure here comes from the architecture you impose upon it, mm -hmm. whereas the states, all those ellipses are really come out from flat space. Is that yeah, they come out, and what you're saying, I think, is that ultimately the programs are all at the same level of, you know, call return level in the operating environment. And the answer is yes. That's exactly what it is. The hierarchy is, is in the design, not in the call return process. Okay. Right. They're all, all the state machines are called by the post office system one at a time whenever there's a message available for it to process. Thank you. Thank you.
64K of RAM and ROM at two synchronous 56 kilobits per second. You'll probably laugh at those numbers you guys are dealing with. Digital outputs, 20 digital inputs, both triggered edge sensitive as well as input level, a flash A to D, and an adjustable uh, voice frequency output. Uh, also have the uh, two digit of LED display in here. And for some of you that are involved in hardware, I'll give you a little bit of flavor. So here it is. That's what the hardware looks like. And let's get back to the software function here. This is what the software looks like. At the top we have the operating system kernel. In this case, it was the DSOS, so the datagram switch operating system. Right here on this side, on the bottom side, we have the drivers, various communication drivers, timer drivers, output drivers, uh, and in some other cases, you could count protocol drivers, etc. And here we have encapsulating all of the state machines. And right here is the message pool. Everything is based on message switching. This is a, a typical event analysis that was done early in the game to show uh, whether the system was capable of sustaining the uh, high throughput requirements. And uh, in, in most traditional cases, the hardware engineer would say, well, let's put in the, you know, the fastest one that we can afford. And, uh, but you always end up with a situation you don't really know how much CPU power you have left in the worst case condition. So the first step in the event analysis is to find out what is your burst rate CPU occupancy and also during the detection, how much CPU you have left. And if you want to stay in the 60% range, that tells you you have pretty much a, a good overall uh, CPU loading. And for those of you who are managers, you will be able to see the chain of command in here, maybe for the military. We have a system manager at the top, and we have some other supervisors down at this level here. And the internal test manager in this case has subordinate state machines that performs, in this case, a slew of test suites. And they each report their results to the test manager upon completion. The test manager is the one that gives the instruction to begin a particular test. There's a poll handler in here that I want to talk about next. So aren't these modules instead of state machines? I'm sorry? Won't you ever call these modules instead of state machines? Yes, each one of these each one of them is a state machine. It's a state machine, right. So in this case, we have this implementation, I believe it had about 25, state, 30 state machines. Here is the message interface diagram uh, in more detail, specifically for the poll handler. For, so from the documentation point of view, uh, each state machine would have at the center itself, and it will show the interfaces to all of the other machines that it would talk to. So therefore, if you're going to have a modification, uh, say for enhancement or maintenance, 
uh, if you know the functionality traceability in here, you say, what, uh, what is the impact? If I need to change the pole handler in here, what is the impact to which modules? And you can identify which state machine modules you're going to be impacting. And so from the management point of view, from the engineering, you can assess what is the impact from the management point of view. You can also assess the, the cost uh, ramifications and schedule uh, for that. As Al pointed out, is uh, once you break down the state machine hierarchy, you can pretty much precisely determine how much time that task is going to take. And uh, I think that in almost 95% of the cases that we've seen, it has always been on schedule and, on, and with the cost. Uh, now I want to get into the actual, to show you and hear what is happening with that pole handler state machine. Here is the behavioral diagram for that pole handler. And you can see the all state condition going into the idle state when the power initializes. And from there, it actually walks between these three states back and forth. And I'm not going to go into any detail of it, but you can see the actual output message. This is the output event whenever you get the system go. So that someone sends you a system go, and you begin the status request. Okay. Here, then, is a transitional matrix that implements that. And you can see it here in the column, you have the states. Here in the row, you have the messages. And you can see that whenever you get the system go, which is three in here, you, if you're in the idle state right here, you will then perform the transition procedure A. And that translates then to this meta language here that again says that if you are in the idle state, and you receive the system go message, you will perform function A. And for those of you who are the software engineers here, your fingers are itching to see some code. Here is the actual code. I don't know where you can really see it back there, but uh, uh, this is the function A code. This is a SCADA implementation. In reality, what it is is a, uh, is a supervisory control and data acquisition system for a telephone office environment. And uh, it performs all of the alarm functions, supervisory functions, and testing functions of an ISDN uh, application. Uh, this one is a dual processing system, multiprocessor on a standard, on an STD bus. Both cases we had an 8088 application. Both processors in here communicated via a RAM mailbox. The DSOS kernel has a routing facility that determines if you're sending a message and if it knows that a particular state machine, whether it's in the local CPU or whether it is in the is in another remote CPU, and it knows the protocol that it needs to use to be able to send that message across to the virtual state machine. So for all practical purposes, if you are in the application processor, that state machine doesn't need to know where the destination state machine is. It actually feels and thinks that a, uh, a, a, a remote uh, state machine is really no, no more than an extension to its own environment. And so you can easily convert by reconfiguring the system very rapidly. You can bring in state machines from remote processors into a local processor or move local state machines into remote processors uh, on the fly. Uh, this is the overall hardware configuration. 512K on ROM, 12-victor uh, interrupt that had quite a bit of CPU loading in this case and the communications processor also in 8088 environment. This is what the hardware looks like. And in reality, the system is right down here. It communicated to some line concentrators in here. And each line concentrator had a CPU, which in turn communicated with line card units across an ISDN. 2B1Q. Uh, yes, 
In your first example, you mentioned the time constraints uh, for the implementation to take no more than three months. That's right. How, how much of that software was available on day one? That is, how much were you able to reuse from what you already had? That was a from scratch. Except uh, so the except for the operating system, of course. Uh, actually, yes, that's not totally true. The only portion of it that was ported from this implementation was the HDLC driver. So some of the drivers were available, but in terms of the state machine implementation, we are all the from scratch. Uh, okay. This is the architectural diagram here. This particular system uh, was equivalent to a 120 state machine uh, scenario. Then getting into a little bit of the testing, as Al explained, the testing tends to be exhaustive because you can take each state machine and since you know precisely for that object, what are all of the inputs and are all, all of the potential outputs, you also have a state transition diagram that tells you under all conditions what are the procedures and processes you're going to take. You can see it completely as a black box testing scenario. Inputs, outputs. And that's exactly how the state machine utility takes it. We would take the DSOS kernel, exactly the same DSOS kernel that we're going to target, and compile it with the state machine utility. In this case, we would bring in <coughs> one state machine at a time. So you're doing unit testing. We would prepare an input test script that would walk that state machine through every particular state, and we would then record the output in the screen, or you can redirect it to a file. You can use the same process for regression testing. You change the state machine. You, you, you may or may not change the input test. You run it completely automated. And you do a diff between the new output and the old output and compare it automatically. So you can run many, many of these completely automated, full regression testing over and over again. So every time you make a change in the software, you can retest the entire slew completely automatically. And this is a sample of the input test script. You're sending messages. You send a code to the poll handler. You execute that. You send a status poll message and you continue walking the code through this. So the person who utilizes the, the, the test the test plan becomes again the same state machine documentation. You may or may not need to develop a complete test plan scenario. This is the output, a sample of the output. Okay, so it, it's the state machine utility, SM utility, is able to record all of the messages or all of the events that go out of the operating system for that particular state machine. Then you can go into an integration environment where you start taking one or two or three of the already tested state machines and you start packetizing them, creating another input script and then recording that output. So integration uh, could take place all statically before you even go into the actual field uh, hardware software integration, and then we can also provide to provide the final runtime environment at that point in time. And here are some of the, this is probably the toughest we're trying to, and at the same time, keep track of some of the statistics in the past.